we just want to thank Brian for taking the time out of his day to talk to us about Alabama basketball and, you know, his memories that he has, especially calling the games like he has for 20 plus years. Um, but l let's dive into the the kind of results for from the over the weekend. Obviously, Alabama beats Arkansas, which I think was a, clo a much closer game than I think anyone had kind of expected. Alabama had to come back down six with a minute and 10 left. Um, right soul hits a huge three. Grant hits a huge three. And for whatever reason, Eric Musselman decides that he's not going to take one of his two timeouts that he has um, in the final 30 seconds or 15 seconds, how much time was left um, to set up a play for success for whatever reason. But we really appreciate him for coming up short like he tends to do against Alabama. Um, but Joey, Charles, you guys want to talk about your thoughts on that game? I think I addressed most of mine on the post game speech, which you guys obviously weren't able to attend. <laughs> obviously, that sounds like it was a little bit of a dig there. We kind of looked you hanging out. The <laughs> <divide there. laughs> I'm sorry, I had to talk to myself in, or myself and Bryant for uh, 30 <laughs> minutes while I was trying to. And you guys already know I don't like to talk that much. So, <laughs> you know, as far as as far as the game goes, um, I will say I didn't get to watch the second half or overtime i was I, but i did listen to it i'm just saying i wasn't able to watch it but um you know obviously not the result that we would have i mean obviously we, we got the win so that's the result we wanted to see but as far as the method to get to that w not exactly what most of us you know predicted um but that being said i thought it was a game that really showed it's with all the all the diversity this team has had the past couple of weeks with injuries and other issues um i really liked the the fight that this team showed because obviously down down in the first half things weren't going their way i think they had eight turnovers in that first half but then they're able to come back bounce back limited it to only three turnovers in the second half and then no turnovers in overtime in a at, at a point where you know quite often you see teams that are able to fight back once it hits overtime there's a little bit of a collapse and alabama wasn't able to do that they were really able to build off of that momentum that they had already carried through the second half so Really like to see that. Not the best shooting day, obviously. You know, they shot 44%, um, but really from three, only nine of 30, which is not, once again, not terrible. But for Alabama standards, um, you really like to see improvement there. Uh, the free throw line, 17 of 25. It's kind of the argument that I always make with, you know, going back to the UCLA game in the Sweet 16 a couple of years ago. You hit one of those free throws, there is no overtime. The game's over, uh, you know, so... Um, you really got to put a stress on that heading into this week. Overall, as far as individual performances, um, Sears got his 22. <laughs> I see if I like to say that every week. And I know, Christian, you've said before that that's something we shouldn't take for granted, and it really isn't. Sears is just, um, while he didn't have his best night um, from beyond the arc, he still had a, had a really solid night. Um, Beth, Grant Nelson, of course, even though with his four fouls, he still had a double double with 14 points, 13 rebounds. He was huge in that game and a really big impact. Nick Pringle, I know Brian Passing has talked about Nick Pringle and the, and the, you know, what he's been able to do. But really, when you take a look at his double double, 10 points, 10 rebounds, he's also really come about. And as far as, uh, you know, another accolade, Sam Walters with his 10 points, it was really good. I mean, we all saw Nate you know, getting overjoyed when, <laughs> when, when Walters in the final minute minutes finally hit that three and was finally getting, I think he hit a free throw as well that really kind of started that. So all of those are building blocks that you really like to see, even if it was a close game, you like to see those building blocks kind of starting to lay a foundation for the SEC tournament coming up this week and, and March Madness the next. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I liked what I saw from this team in that second half and in that overtime period compared to what we had seen in the past couple of weeks when they've been, you know, having some issues. Yeah, I mean, you got to you got to praise the fight for the team. Down six with two minutes left, down 15 in the first half. Uh, I, I was frustrated, as I'm sure many Alabama fans were frustrated with the first half performance. And some of the things that were being said on the broadcast, I think it was by Jimmy Dykes, as far as Coach Oates talking about where is this team's head go going to be without a chance to win the SEC regular season championship. And look, it was a very, you know, obviously it's a long season and you put a lot into it and you have, uh, you just come up short against Tennessee in an incredible home game environment. You go down to Florida, um, you don't play well there. Um, Griffin gets hurt, Wrightsville comes back, but doesn't really play a whole lot of minutes. So 
you can understand the team kind of being reeling a little bit and being worn down. But it was a game from the very start that you had an opportunity to secure a double bye in the SEC tournament, which I think, as we we all know, and Brian just talked about too, this team needs to get healthy and needs to get rested. Well, if you don't win that game on Saturday, you're playing Thursday, even if it's against the 12 or 13 seed in the five, or, or you know, it could have even been the the six seed had Florida held on and beaten Vanderbilt. And, and, you know, from here on out, every game we play is for a championship, whether it's the SEC tournament or the NCAA tournament. But you just would have hoped that as far as seeding in the SEC and seeding in the NCAA tournament, I mean, we're right there in the three, four, five seed conversation that you just would have seen, I don't know, more, more energy or just a better start coming off of that. But you have to credit the team as far as the effort and the fight that they did bring in the second half and sticking together, guys like Nick Pringle continue to play better, Mark Sears doing his thing, Latrell Reitzel doing his thing, coming back. And, and as you mentioned, Sam Walters, the two overtime games we've had against Florida and against Arkansas at home, he's just been phenomenal and just really hope that as we get into the SEC tournament that he can really keep that positive play going and – uh, start hitting some big shots because that we our three point shooting has has really tailed off in the past couple of games, and I do think some of that has to do with with Latrell Reitzel's injury. Look for the first twelve games of the year, obviously leading the the SEC, and you know was shooting about thirty eight percent from the three point line, making about twelve and a half threes per game. The defense we were holding teams in the SEC under eighty points. And in his five games that he didn't play in, and I'm, I'm including the Florida game in that as well because he did play very sparingly in that game. You know, we, we were giving up almost 97 points a game. We were only hitting about eight and a half threes. I think the thing that sticks out the most about, you know, with Reitzel and without Reitzel is the fast break points. We were winning fast break points. I think we were averaging about 15 fast points, fast break points a game and holding teams to about eight, whereas in his absence, we didn't win a single, you know, fast break. We didn't win a game based off fast break, break points. We lo we lost in that margin against everybody we played. And then in Arkansas, we actually did win the fast break points 16 to 11. So that was really interesting. And then Sears playing an additional five minutes per game obviously was wearing him down. And I'm, you know, Estrada and some other guys were having to play more minutes too. Um, and it's, you know, Brian talked about it. I think there were some articles about how efficient Reitzel has been throughout the year. But when I look at our, our team, it, it is important to get Latrell back. But I think it's important to get Ryland back. And I think it's important for Grant Nelson to stay out of foul trouble. We, we've got certain guys that they need to be healthy and they need to be on the floor for us to be a good basketball team. So as excited as I am to get Latrell back, and feel like this team is going to take a step forward, we need all of our guys to be healthy and rested as we go throughout this SEC tournament and the NCAA tournament as well. And one thing I want to mention about Grant Nelson is he picked up his fourth foul with, I think, about 15 minutes to go in the second half and didn't yeah. foul out. Um, so I don't know what – maybe it was the officiating or maybe it was, you know, just him understanding how the officials were calling the game – but credit to Grant for being able to play um, their last 15. He didn't play the entire last 15 minutes, but play the last 15 minutes and overtime. So it's almost 20 minutes. I don't know how many minutes he actually got on the court, but be able to play without fouling and, and still be effective. Obviously he hits the, the, I think the, the, the shot that puts Alabama within three um, with a minute to go. And then, um, stayed out on the court and was still able to be effective in overtime that ultimately got Alabama the win. I think, I, I think that's, that's crucial and hopefully it helps him going into the NCAA tournament. Um, additionally, I will say as far as the foul shooting and the, and just the overall officiating, as you get into postseason play, um, officials are a little bit more lenient with regards to um, fouls. They're not going to be, trying to muck up the game um, like we've seen in a few Alabama games in the past, I'm mainly um, just Auburn and Florida. If I'm, if I'm thinking of how the, those games kind of ended up down the stretch with back and forth foul calls, 
you don't see that much in postseason play. Obviously, it does happen, but I don't think it it's something that Alabama should be too terribly concerned about going into the NCAA tournament and the SEC tournament. And that's something that would be a huge benefit for us because when you look at all of our games in the SEC this year, we shot 86 less free throws than our opponents. Um, still only made less than 49. So we shot it at a better percentage. Uh, but it's not just, you know, them shooting more free throws than us throughout the year. And you know, we've talked about our challenges on defense and being able to guard but we're complicating those challenges by fouling as well with playing defense. For the first nine games of the SEC slate, we were only giving up about 20% of our opponent's points coming from the free throw line. In the last nine games, almost 26, 27% of their points are coming from the free throw line as well. So we're giving our teams easy, easy shots, unguarded shots at the free throw line. And by doing that too, we're obviously getting our guys into foul trouble. That's keeping our most, keeping some of our players in the most efficient offense in college basketball having to be on the sidelines as well. So, look, if we're not going to be a good defense or if we're not going to guard efficiently, just don't complicate it with the foul situation. I think Grant Nelson has fouled out of six SEC games. That's the only, uh, only games he's fouled out has been SEC games all year. But he's got to be a guy that's that's on the floor. Uh, and I know he's playing out of position of what we wanted him to do. And he's had to put, you know, put a lot on his shoulders. And I know he wants to play physical and contest shots. But we cannot afford for him to be on the sidelines, even with Nick Pringle's positive play and how he's been leading the team as well. We need guys like that on the floor contributing on the, on both sides, but specifically the offensive side as well. Absolutely. Um, now, shifting gears just a little bit, um, talking about the SEC tournament, I think Alabama got the probably worst draw that Alabama could have gotten as far as Florida's being on their side of the bracket, Kentucky's being on their side of the bracket. Those are two very high-powered offensive teams that if you've been watching Alabama basketball, which I assume if you're listening to this podcast, then you've watched at least some Alabama basketball games this season – Alabama struggled defensively. I think their last I checked, they were ranked 102nd in Kim Palm per on defensive efficiency. Um, the first time that they played Kentucky, they allowed Kentucky to score 117 points. Last time that they played Florida, I think Florida scored 105, 105 points, I believe. Um, so for Alabama to make a run in the SEC tournament, you probably didn't want to play Florida and Kentucky or have the potential to play Florida and Kentucky. You probably wanted to play your slower pace type of team, maybe in Auburn or South Carolina. Um, I think if we play Tennessee again, we probably, you, you, you get a good chance of beating Tennessee. I'm not saying that they would, um, but you kept it within seven and it was closer than that without Latrell right. So on your home floor, obviously it's in Tennessee, but what are your guys' thoughts on Alabama's potential as far as going into the SEC tournament and making a potential run? Yeah, you know, for me, I think, I think it all. I think a lot of it revolves around who they play first. I mean, I think if Georgia is able to pull off an upset and take down Florida, um, I definitely like Alabama's chances of making it to the semifinal. Um, I do think ultimately, though, if Alabama's defense can improve, I think with the way Kentucky's offense is structured and just how, you know, just really phenomenal they've been playing um, since conference play. Um, I, I don't see Alabama necessarily going really far, which is unfortunate. But the positive thing about that, though, is that that gives them more time to rest um, heading into the NCAA tournament, especially if let's 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 assume that Ryland Griffin isn't isn't still not available to come back this weekend. I think he probably will be. But if he's not and they're having to rest him, that gives, you know, the entire team a couple more days rest and and time for him to potentially get ready for the next weekend. So um, I think Bama can definitely um, win the first game. Uh, I think they, they the road will probably end on day two. Um, but at the same time, I also have Florida as potentially a sleeper pick for this tournament. Um, Florida has been playing some really good basketball. And Florida is one of those teams that, you know, unlike other teams in the conference, Florida is one of those teams that it doesn't matter if they're playing on the road or at home. They are a really, really good team regardless of what court they're playing on. So um, I really like that. I do agree with you, Christian. I think that Bama just has a really, really tough draw 
Um, it's really when you look at the other side, there are still some good teams. And of course, Tennessee, Auburn and South Carolina has had a fantastic year. But when you just look at the, at the, at the level of Bama side of the bracket it is, it is unfortunate, but you know, that's why we play these tournaments, <laughs> you know, who knows? And maybe, maybe Mizzou will make a run. That, that's the beauty of, of, it's, of, you know, these conference tournaments, you don't really, you never really know. And you also, you know, never really know who, who really wants it most and who really wants that automatic qualifier heading in the next week. Yeah, I agree that it was a tough draw, but if there's a seed that's been really good to Alabama in the history of the SEC tournament, it's it's been the three seed. Um, not going into when we had divisions as far as East and West, um, but just looking at the last five times that Alabama was the three seed in the NCAA tournament, which would have been 82, 85, 86, 90, and 91, that's five championship game appearances for Alabama and three championships from those three seed uh, position as well. So um, that hopefully I'm putting some good vibes out there that the three seed will be good to us this weekend. Um, I'm also going to put out there that we haven't beaten Kentucky in the SEC tournament since 1983. So we're due. Um, and a three seed has not won the SEC tournament since 2013 when Andy Kennedy and Marshall Henderson at Ole Miss beat Florida to win the SEC tournament that year. So it is a tough, tough draw. I think it's, in a way, somewhat of a good draw for us, though, to if we can keep winning, you're going to win by playing good defense. The all, Both games against Florida and Kentucky are going to be high scoring because both of those teams are really good on the offensive side. But you're going to have to win it by getting some stops. So it's going to challenge us, in a sense, getting ready for the NCAA tournament of having to get some stops. And it's going to be probably NCAA tournament type games atmospheres that's going to get you ready for the following week too once you get into the NCAA tournament wherever we're going to be so no doubt it's a tough draw Joey I, I 100% agree what is a team that could get into this and win the whole SEC tournament just with their depth and with their players Kentucky's the hottest team uh, in the conference they've been playing really really well I think I did see something that you know, Drake was performing in Lexington, though. So, and 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 Cal Perry, I think also, Christian, you may have tweeted this out or, or commented about it, you know, kind of dismissing the SEC tournament or at least just, you know, our focus is on the NCAA tournament. So how focused are they going to be coming into the SEC tournament? So uh, with anything, there's a lot of variables off the court that goes into it, too. Um, the most important thing for us, I think, is let's get the offense going again. Let's get our three-point shots going. Let's get guys healthy. Let's get guys rested. Um, and let's try to play defense with, without fouling and continue to, to grow as much as we can here in the last couple of weeks. And if we, can, if we can get that back to, you know, what was playing like a top 50, top 60 defense when we were playing Mississippi State um, at the midway point in the SEC tournament, then you got to – you got to like our chances to to make a run here in March and especially get to the, the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. And let's just hope that uh, Drake wore a lot of uh, Kentucky <laughs> Wildcats garb all up in Lexington, so maybe some of that juju will rub off. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so weird about that because I, I – maybe someone said it or someone told me um, that – maybe Cal had a press conference and he was like, oh, yeah, we put the whole team – um, they all went to the concert and they got Rob Dillingham to come up on the stage and all of that. And I'm like, man, you're preparing for postseason play. Why are you? Uh, maybe it's just different. And they're like you, like I said, maybe they just don't care about SEC tournament. Which for some people, like that, that's totally fair. For like a team, a storied team like Kentucky, winning the SEC tournament's not really going to do much for like their history or anything like that. I mean, I, it's more of like an expectation than like a, a celebration, if that makes sense. Um, so, but it's just so interesting that, that he's saying that two days before, or yeah, two days before the SEC tournament, um, when you're supposed to be trying to get your guys ready. And I know having relax or relaxing and having breaks and stuff. I mean, that's part of it. I guarantee you, we haven't been practicing all week. Right. And, but I just don't think that that's the type of message that should be being sent to your players as far as um, locking in for March is just kind of my opinion. 
even though they've been playing better and it really except for a half against LSU, they've, they've definitely been the best team in the SEC. But we've all seen the reports from their own fans, their own media outlets of, you know, is it time to move on from Calipari? So it it is interesting that that would be out there, that that's something that they would do going into the SEC tournament to where if it doesn't go their way, now you've got something that fans can point at as far as well. You weren't you weren't focused. You weren't preparing them the right way. Now, look, it's eighteen, especially for him. It's eighteen, nineteen year olds that are all about to go to the NBA as well because they've got incredible talent, and that may just be how things are now as it relates to college students and you know doing fun things like that. And that's what keeps your team together. But very very interesting that he was making comments about it as well as you mentioned leading into the SEC tournament. Yeah, and again, I don't I don't remember exactly where I saw that. That might have been someone saying something that he made a comment or I might have seen a tweet somewhere. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but speaking on uh tournaments, let's let's just do a quick uh quick bracket update for for everyone that uh is listening. Alabama, I think uh as of a few hours ago from Joe Lenardi was projected as the 15th overall seed um in the NCAA tournament. Um, projected to play in Spokane versus um, who was it? Uh, UC, I have it right here. I have UC right here. Irvine, I believe. Uh, as of right now, let me let me make sure this has been updated. This has been this was as of this morning. Um, I'm on the website. Um, they have Ballard playing in in uh, Spokane with five seed Clemson, twelve seed Richmond, and uh, thirteen seed Vermont. He has Bama as a four seed. Oh. Um. On the other side of that bracket in Indianapolis is number one, Purdue. And then you have the play-in game between Norfolk State and Grambling State, and then Texas and Florida Atlantic. So that's – Bama would have to beat, you know, two of those teams to make the – or sorry, three of those teams to make the Elite Eight. <laughs> if, it, if it is Vermont that we play in the first round, can we get Daniel Giddens as a special guest? As of right now, that's who they play Vermont. So if I'll we get if we get Vermont, then I'll I'll try to pull some strings to see what we can do. Um, <laughs> but for Alabama, you you know how this is going to go. Everyone knows how this is going to go. Alabama is probably going to somehow find their way to play Bucky and Sanford or um, McNeese State. Somehow is going to be a thirteen, or Alabama is somehow going to drop to a five, and we're going to have to play Will Wade. Uh, or we're going to play Bucky. And then the next thing is that somehow Gonzaga is going to be the five seed in Alabama's region playing in Spokane. I, I just, there it's Alabama basketball. I think that should be the expectation. Um, somehow Gonzaga has convinced the NCAA tournament that they're not the host site for their own city, um, which is just brilliant by them. But um, that's how it's going to be. And Alabama's going to play an away game because that's what, that's what's going to happen. And the the one year that I, I am down on an Alabama team in March is the year that they're somehow going to make a run. I, I can tell you that right now. Um, and maybe that's a good thing um, because anytime I'm negative, it turns out as a positive. Anytime I'm positive, it turns out as a negative. I'm also not allowed back in Coleman, according to multiple <laughs> sources. So um <laughs> But what are your what are your guys' thoughts and uh, potential projections for Alabama as far as uh, getting to the NCAA tournament, making a run? Well, if it holds, it let's let's just hypothesize and assume that what Lenardi has here is correct. Obviously, you don't like you don't like them playing in Spokane, um, but we, if you look at the slate of teams, um, Vermont, you know, I, I think they're a they're a solid team, but my, the big team you got to look at there, obviously, is the five seed in Clemson. Moving on, um, Clemson, obviously, a team that gave Alabama some struggles earlier this year. But on the flip side of that, this is a Clemson team that really hasn't changed a lot, I don't believe, since Bama have played them last. Whereas Alabama has gotten a lot better. Um, so I really like Bama's chances in a rematch on a what will be a pretty much the most neutral floor you can possibly have all the way out in Washington. Um, I really, you know, I, I, I really like that draw and the fact that you could potentially also play Purdue again, potentially, you know, it'd just be a rematch after rematch for Alabama. Um, I like the draw. I know that we would obviously rather much rather have them. I know you'd like to have them in a, I know they won't be going to Charlotte Christian cause that's way too high, um, or way too low for them, but wouldn't that be nice? 
Um, I would like to see them play closer, but Bama fans travel. And when you look at the rest of those fan bases, they're all East Coast. So it would be it would be a an equal travel time for everybody to get out there. And there's obviously a, probably a good bit of Bama fans out there in Seattle that could come down. So I like that draw, but I know Charles will be able to break it down a lot better than I can. <laughs> I, I just think the more teams that we can play that we have not played against is is going to be a benefit for us because of the tempo that we play and how efficient we have been on offense. We we should have asked Greg Byrne earlier today about bracketing since he's part of the selection committee, which if you haven't seen that interview, go go check that out from earlier today. It was really good insights as far as just athletics and NIL and, and Alabama. Um, so I, I don't know if we could really play Clemson in the second round based off of – I mean, obviously, if, if Lenardi's putting it in there, we could, but he's also put us in there against teams in the first round that we've played. So um, anyway, with that – you know, the more, like I said, the more teams that we can play that haven't played us, I think there's could be a little bit of a shock to the system, especially if we play well and, and hit shots. The problem becomes when we get into the Sweet 16, where we played Purdue this year. Um, I don't think we'd play a ten, if Tennessee was a one seed. I don't think we would play them um, in the Sweet 16. But everybody else that's being discussed as a one seed. Connecticut, Houston, and North Carolina, we all played last year. So all those, some of those players and those coaches have seen it as well. Um, so I, on the one side, you know, as Alabama fans, we've been dying for great matchups and to play good competition in the non-conference. Well, even though we didn't play all those teams this year, we continue to play really good basketball programs. So a credit to, to Nate Oates and the staff for putting together, you know, playing good teams. Um, but two, there won't obviously those are going to be good teams anyway, and there won't really be a shot to the system. But we also know too, with how crazy last year was, no one seeds made it to the Elite Eight, and I think only one two seed made it to the Elite Eight, and that was Texas. Um, so you just got to get in there. You got to hopefully we're playing the best basketball um, of the season, not only on the offensive side but the defensive side as well, and just let March Madness take care of itself and see where the chips fall, and hopefully you you get to continue to play a couple mid-majors or low-majors because we've obviously had a lot of success against them this year uh, and have been over been able to overwhelm them with our pace and with our ability just to continuously score baskets, even if we're giving up baskets here and there. So, um, you know, just excited to see where we're eventually going to, to fall. Um, it'd be really interesting to see where, based off of, you know, if we lose to Florida, or, or whoever in the first round of the SEC tournament, do we drop to a five seed? If we make it all the way to the SEC championship or win the SEC championship, do we jump all the way to the three seed? Just how that's all going to play out and the teams around that as well, um, like a Kentucky, if we're the one who beats them, like Kansas, who I think is dealing with some players being out as they go into the Big 12 tournament. And just just the typical things the the movement back and forth that you have in this particular week. But it's obviously, I, I'm sure just like y'all, one of my favorite times of the year, just to sit back and watch really good basketball and be entertained by um, teams across the country and just the excitement around it. So looking forward to to it, but hopefully we're going to be a key part of that conversation here of the no, next couple of weeks as well. Yeah. And I, and I talked to uh, Delphi brackets. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that interview um, but I went on their podcast and they just wanted to talk about Alabama basketball and like the fandom. But uh, I went back and forth with them and DMs and just asking about the seating. Uh, Alabama, according to them, at least as of Saturday or S Sunday, I believe, I can't remember when I talked to them, is on the four line right now. I, I, I lost to Florida doesn't do anything as far as their resume, as far as Alabama's resume is concerned. Um, you might be the last four seed. Um, I they they have us as the 14th I think overall seed, um, and I trust them a lot more than I trust Joe Lonardi, who's on average outside the top 100 as far as bracketologists are concerned. There's only like 200 or so bracketologists. Um, he's a great tool for for fans to kind of get a general guideline of where their their teams are. Um, I do believe that he was the first person to put Alabama as a four seed. Um, and that was prior to the Kentucky game. 
Um, and then after the Kentucky game, almost every single bracketologist dropped us to a four. So he does kind of move the market as far as like that type of movement. But as far as when it comes down to the nitty gritty, um, I'm not so much trusting exactly what he's putting out there. Um, but with a win versus Kentucky, I was told that that would go a very, very long way as far as seeding is concerned. Main reason is, is if Kentucky loses, then that's a team that you're directly competing for for a seed line. Um, and it's a it's a real way to show some movement along that line. Um, they they told me that Alabama can move up to a three seed if they beat Kentucky. Obviously, it depends on how the dominoes type of, kind of fall. Um, but it would go a long way to beat Kentucky. Obviously, now with Kansas having the injuries to um, Dickinson and uh, McClure, that I think that's how you say his name. Again, terrible pronunciation. So um, with with those two guys, it also comes into question kind of where Kansas is going to fall on that line. Now, there is a potential for – because Kansas was projected as a three seed. If they lose early in the Big 12, they can move to a four. Does that push Alabama back? Does Alabama jump them? It all It's all subjective and um, a lot of movement. Um, that's why these conference tournaments are so important. And I know some people do have conversations about whether or not that is an important thing. I think one thing to mention about that is um, we were talking with Greg and your total resume matters, right? It's not, oh, what have you done for me in the last two weeks? They're looking at games in January. They're looking at games in November. Um, obviously, they use those types of recent success to be able to determine, okay, where is a team right now, especially with the team dealing with injuries and things like that. But it's a whole resume body of work. And that's why, for the most part, you don't see much movement in conference tournaments. But when you're comparing teams that are so close with Kentucky, Kansas, Alabama, um, things like that, Auburn, um, as well, winning and getting those quad one opportunities, which is where Alabama is kind of, it's kind of eluded Alabama. They've been kind of unfortunate because all of their big, big time opponents have either been top 10, top 15 net opponents, or they've been borderline quad one teams. Um, Mississippi state, Florida, Ole Miss, um, Indiana state's right on the cut line for a Q1. Like the those teams are a ball bounces a certain way. Alabama's looking at 500 in quad one. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it shapes out. Hopefully, Alabama gets some lucky bounces, which they haven't gotten this year. Um, speaking of Indiana State, you want to give a prediction, uh, in or out before selection Sunday without knowing what bids are going to be stolen? I mean. Indiana State is one of those teams. They're 29th in the net. And I know the net's not a ranking tool. It's a sorting tool. But if you have a team that's 29th in the net, like, you're saying that they're one of the top 30 teams in the country. They're a Q1 opponent no matter where you play them for anybody. Exactly. Um, and I understand maybe their strength schedule isn't great and they they didn't win their tournament. But it's they're, those are – those are one of the teams where, like, I I understand the the strength of schedule argument. I get it because, you know, we're on the flip side of that where Alabama's played the toughest strength of schedule um, in the country as far as, like, offense is concerned. Maybe the toughest strength of schedule overall. Um, played the second hardest SEC tournament or SEC schedule. Like, and we're, we're sitting here with 10 losses. And – you're like, hey, like we played a tough schedule. You shouldn't hurt us for it. But on the flip side, like, like you said, if 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 they're a quad one team, regardless of where they are playing, then they should be in the tournament. There's there shouldn't be a question about whether or not they should be in the tournament. And they have the what's his name? The I don't know his actual name, but the Kareem Abdul Jabbar is what they call him. <laughs> yeah. Um I like they have the the player and the storyline to to make a March story. I don't, and they're going to have TV viewership just because of that guy. And um, it's one of those teams where I think you put them in just because of their whole body of work. Put them in against Michigan state in the play in game. 
get some, <laughs> get some eyeballs on the play-in games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention J and J, our apparel sponsor. Um, go shop J and J Apparel. We have some stuff coming out this uh, this off season, and maybe we will have some some tournament swag coming out if uh, Alabama decides that they're going to make a run and put everything together. Um, but keep on the lookout for that. Um, in addition, obviously, we're presented by the Field of Sixty Eight. Just so thankful for them to have us on this podcast network and allowing us to do the the things we have, like the Greg Byrne interview that we just did covering college game day, um, getting more eyeballs on at this Alabama basketball program, which is most deserved, um, I believe. Um, but if you haven't checked out that Greg Byrne interview, then go check it out. It, um, Greg, I'm so thankful for him to take the time out of his day to talk to us. Um, especially because he's going to D.C. and then going to Indianapolis directly after for the bracket committee. But um, as far as our schedule is concerned for the the rest of the week and getting in the NCAA tournament play, um, we may – I haven't talked to the guys about it, um, but we may do a, a SEC tournament preview um, space just so people can get their thoughts out. But we're not going to be doing SC, or spaces um, during the SEC tournament unless we lose. Um, main reason for that is – uh, one, I don't want to be on a space every single night if we get to the championship from Friday to Sunday um, talking about Alabama basketball when we can just lump sum everything together into one. Um, and then two, uh, I just I really don't think it's that beneficial. Um, I do know people like to talk about the game um, immediately after, but um, I think everyone can hold their thoughts until we have like a, a recap space. Um, which is beneficial for me. It's beneficial for my wife. It's beneficial for these guys' wives where um, we're not going to be sitting here, you know, at right now it's 11, 16, my time. So 10, 16 there um, talking about Alabama basketball, which we love to do, but sometimes it is good to have a little bit of a break. But um, additionally on Sunday, we're going to do like a, again, a season recap type space with, um, leading into the bracket reveal on Sunday um, night. I think that starts at 6 um, Eastern. So we're going to start that 30 minutes before the bracket reveal um, just so we can get all of our thoughts out and then to kind of do like a live react of the bracket. Um, and then next week we have Evan Maya coming on to talk about uh, – the he, he does uh, statistics and analytics for – um, all of college basketball, but I we thought it'd be very beneficial for us to kind of get like a rundown of he does even bracket simulations, right? And get a rundown as where does he think Alabama is going to be? So, um, and how they're going to perform in the NCAA tournament. Um, but other than that, uh, if you guys don't have anything else, I think I think we're uh, we're good to call it a night or a, a day when this comes out, and uh, we'll talk again either Thursday or after Alabama wins or lose the SEC tournament. But um, with that, uh, roll tide. Roll tide. Roll tide.